This video is sponsored by NordVPN. Secure your internet and get a two year plan at a huge discount plus four additional months for free. This is my little box of treasures here. I feel like those people who used to be on Oxford Street selling like Ralph Lauren shirts. Tag her watch, 20 pounds. Yes, please, I have five of them. Badge fell off. Anyway, I digress. If you want to take up film photography, what's the best, what is best first of all? But you could get one of these. Massive, monster, Pentax 6.7. I love this but probably you shouldn't go for medium format for your first film camera. It's just a bit fiddly. Probably not a lot of many places will develop it. They probably won't even know what it is. If you go to some snappy snaps, they'll say, why is that so big? Film, that is. So what exactly is 120 film? Well, here it is. Freshly packed. So what's so special about medium format? Well, when you compare it to the size of 35 millimeter film, you can see the size difference. Larger film service means better detail, better image quality. But whereas with 35 mm film, it usually uses 35 by 24 mm space, medium format, there are different formats. 645 being six by 4.5 centimeters, then you've got six by six square or six by seven. I mean, six by seven is a huge bit of film to use, but then you can see how huge the cameras are. The best place to start is 35 mm film. It's tiny, gives you 36 shots, unless you're doing half frame, you get twice that, obviously. 35 millimeter, in my opinion, is the best format. It's got the perfect balance of good quality and a reasonably sized body. It's a lot smaller than full frame small. I mean, just check out the depth of that. And this has got a folding, flapping, flipping mirror inside as well, and it's that thin. That's because the film actually sits really close to the back of the camera. The film comes wound into a tiny little canister that you whack into your camera, wind and shoot. It's a simpler, slicker process than with 120. A smaller, lighter body is less of a burden when you're going out on a shoot, but also when it comes to the film, there's more options. There's higher ISO film and it's quite a lot easier to get it developed. Plenty of places that develop this lovely stuff. There's just so many different films to try out, but let's get back to the camera choice first. This is a good place to start because it gives you nothing. I mean, with digital technology these days, you're used to having the best, the latest, but because you're shooting with film, with old film cameras, the technology can only get so good. So why not go back to the start where there was no technology at all? It's a manual film camera. It's all mechanical. There's a shutter button and a little thing here which controls some little springs and wires and things like that, and cogs. It's not a must to go completely old, old school. Sometimes it's just nice to have some automatic features for convenience sake. I do think SLRs, single lens reflex, are great for first cameras. It uses mirrors and stuff to reflect the image coming through the lens up into the viewfinder. So what you see is exactly what you'll get on film. Unless you have cataracts or you forgot to put your glasses on. Well, one problem with an all mechanical camera is that the shutter speed only goes so fast. This is one thousandth of a second, which is quite slow when you compare it to a digital camera. But perhaps a big issue with some of these older mechanical cameras is that they don't have light meters. And unless you've learned the Sunny 16 rule, then I think it's a very good idea to get light meters so you know what settings to use on your camera to get the perfect exposure. Now, as I mentioned before, you can either get a Voigtlander or you can use some iPhone apps. But if you want to shoot on things like slide film, then you definitely need a light meter to nail that exposure. Because slide films, although they provide lush colors, they're a bit fussier when it comes to exposure. They have a poorer exposure latitude when compared to negative film. Sure, the colors aren't as lush, but you can get them developed practically anyway. You can even do it yourself a lot easier than with slide film. It's cheaper to develop and you can get the exposures quite wrong and it can still be fit in the developing process. When starting out in film photography, it's a good idea to use negative film first. It just makes it a little bit easier to get results that you'll be pleased with. But the point is, it's very useful to have a light meter, whether you have an add-on accessory like the Voigtlander or you have one built into your camera. There's also the option of a handheld light meter, but walking around the street holding what appears to be an aircon remote with a ping pong ball on the end of it up in the air is a bit clunky, if not a bit silly. You're better off with something a bit more discreet like this Voigtlander VC meter or the slicker solution is to buy a camera with a light meter built in. No electronics, just mechanics. You won't think, oh, is it full frame? Has it got lots of mega pickles? No, no pickles at all. It shoots the same film as a really expensive Leica camera. So that's, that's all that matters. 
it has a little curtain that opens, closes, lets the light in. It really is up to you. you. Might prefer something with a fast autofocus and some sort of a burst rate. I mean, it wasn't all that long ago that they're still making pro level cameras like this, the Canon EOS 1B, where you can take 10 film frames per second. There's one film camera that will make you feel poorer every time you rattle off a whole load of bursts. And the great thing is that you can get all of this pro level film camera goodness like this for not very much at all. But with film, you really do need to think of it as a bit overkill. But as cool as high performing film camera is, you really have to think about what it is you're photographing. It's probably quite unlikely that you're going to be photographing birds or sports, right? And with sports, something like this, it's going to get expensive, right? And birds, you're going to probably want something a bit more clinical, a bit more detailed. So just go for digital, right? I mean, this is a hobby which doesn't really make sense by modern standards. So why not go all the way and go proper old school? with something that's completely manual. With Film Advanced, leave manual focus, just manual everything, no computer controlled bits, no automation at all. Because it goes really well with and it'll make you appreciate the whole slow process of film photography. It is super crucial to think about what lenses it is that you want to use because at the end of the day, these cameras are just light tight boxes and on the opposite of the rear of the lens, it's the film, and as I said before, it's the same film that you can put in the Canon EOS 1V, a Lomography camera, or even a Leica. Now, the reason why I picked Nikon SLRs as a good entry into film photography is because, well, Nikon lens prices remain quite stable, and there's plenty to choose from because the F-mount has remained unchanged since forever. So there are decades upon decades of Nikon glass to choose from, and perhaps that is why prices have remained stable, unlike, say, Canon FD lenses, which have been steadily increasing in price over the years. And there's so many bargains on, say, Fleabay that you don't have to spend too much to get you a camera that will allow you to use some interesting lenses like this. This came at a time when Pentax was actually quite good. This is an M42 screw mount. It's a fiddly bugger. It's not the quickest process to mount and unmount your lens. But you know, that's why they can be had for such bargains. And it's not just Pentax lenses that are available. You can get Fujinons and some cheap Russian lenses. And you do get what you pay for. My Russian lens fell apart. But you know, on the other hand, life's too short, so why not go on a huge massive splurge fest? But you know, as I'm kind, here's a suggestion on how to splash the cash in a moderate way. This is probably one of the best Leicas you can get. And probably one of the most affordable because not many people want it. It's not that ugly. I mean, if you can get over the way it looks, in fact, not just get over it, you can really appreciate it. It might not have the classic good looks, but there's something about it. There's something quite masculine and brick-like. If you can appreciate how cool a brick looks, then you'll like the way this looks. And I've got the Gerd Bollinger edition here, a very famous um, German. That might look like it's some owner's name, some German fellow who just engraved his name in, but no, it's not. That's a limited edition, one of one. The battery here, which goes in here, that was a mercury battery. Don't want to use that, just in case you swallow it. It could be quite dangerous, yeah? So it's a little bit different in that, you know, with, with the other Leicas, you'd have a little bit of space here, so your face isn't completely covered, but here it's, it sticks out just that little bit more. You can see that. When you cut the flap, it's off center. With the other Leicas, the M3s, it's right in the center, and it'd be like that. I mean, originally you probably wouldn't use this light meter. It's got a built-in light meter with it. M2, M3 didn't have a light meter built in. M4, M4P, M4 M4 no light meter. M5 was actually the first like M to have a built-in light meter. So this was quite revolutionary. Then you had M6, which is quite a practical M body, but there's just too bloody many of them. They've got the Highland King edition, they've got the lots of limited editions, lots of stupid limited editions. That's kind of when things went a bit crazy. And then the M7, you've got TTL metering. Um, I think it's, you've got aperture priority exposure and an MP. But they're kind of a different price level. This can be had for super cheap. I got this for about uh, 500 pounds. And if you compare that to some of the other bodies like the M3, which is considered a classic, that was probably gonna stretch to about 800 pounds, 900 pounds, depending on how clean, how nice the condition is. It's pretty good, if you think about it, 500 quid. 
If you want a Leica that is practical, not just take photos of yourself in the mirror with, the M5 is fantastic value for money for a Leica. But really don't just go splurging all your cash on the most expensive Leica body you can find and realize that you can't afford or don't want to spend your money on some lovely Leica glass because that really is more than 50% of the reason of shooting Leica. The M5 came with either two-way or three-way strap mounting system. This one's a two-way, which I think is a lot cleaner. Three-way, you've got another strap mount here. But this one's pretty cool, it's quite unique. You put it around your neck like this, instead of having it mounted this way. Not much difference, but you know, just a bit more unique, isn't it? Nice little necklace that's a sneaky camera. You just tuck it in like that. Of course, it's not very sneaky, because as I said, it looks like you're pregnant with a camera. If you're going to go for rangefinders, you might as well get a Leica because you're going to lust after one anyway, but if you have to keep the budget low, then get the Canon 7. That is a fine, fine choice. Just in case you're wondering what a rangefinder is, an SLR uses mirrors and stuff to let you look through the viewfinder and see through the lens. Thus, you see exactly what you're going to get. A rangefinder uses a separate window, which some might say is a friendlier way of taking photos because you can see the photographer's eyes, so therefore it's probably good for street photography or something. But bear in mind that when the subject gets close, it becomes less accurate for framing. Okay, film compact cameras. Every film photographer should have a compact camera. Even if you've got fancy cameras, bigger format cameras, it's nice to have one of these tucked away in your pocket. It's full frame and it fits in your pocket. The point of a film compact camera is that you don't need to think too much about settings. You just point and you shoot. And there are plenty of options for different budgets from say a Canon Top Twin or Olympus XA to some more expensive offerings. Some premium compact cameras that have kept premium price tags mainly due to their celebrity fan base. Think Kendall Jenner, that's the tall one, not the uh, shorter one that does, uh, what does she do? Don't actually know. Or rappers, not the people who package presents. And other celebs, but my choice would be the GR1 mainly because it's not popular with celebrities. It's small, it's lightweight, it was used by Dido Moriyama before he started using crap digital compact cameras. Sharp lens fits in the palm of your hand and quick and easy to use. There you are. But yeah, there are just so many fantastic film cameras to choose from. Enjoy hunting for one, but most importantly, don't overthink it. You know, don't think, is this sharper than that? Does this have better autofocus than that? If you're gonna think that way, just buy digital. This was my first camera and lens. I didn't care about how good or bad the lens was or the fact that there weren't many features on the camera. What I most looked forward to was putting some nice Velvia in and climbing some big bloody hills to take some cool photos. Buying the best film camera is different to how you buy the best digital camera, where it's all about figuring out which camera produces the best, sharpest image, which one focuses quicker, shoots more shots per second, and takes high-res video without overheating. When you get into film, you'll soon realise it's all about the character. You'll gravitate towards the camera for the way it looks and how it feels in use. You'll pick lenses for not having the most insane sharpness, but for the way it uniquely renders an image. And then the film itself. that is what you'll get fanatic about because there are so many different emulsions with so many different looks. Forget LUTs and effects, load up on your favorite film and have a jolly good time. But most importantly, just have fun with the whole process of shooting with film and love the perfectly imperfect look of film photos. Leica M5, I'm just, I'm just rushing through it because we had a Mormon talking to Locke just now. Blame on them. I'm absolutely zipping through this like I just don't care because I've got to pick up my son up in a moment. Um, so there we are, and do the rest in voiceover. Boom, thanks, see you again, bye. Bye, new old school photography. 100 things you must know to take fantastic film photos by Kai Wong. Old school photography, designed to get you from photography zero to photography hero. Available in most major bookshops now. Pre-order yours to avoid disappointment. Okay, so just a quick break to tell you about the sponsor of this video, NordVPN. You know what a VPN is? What is a NordVPN? Well, it's a service I've been using for over three years. It's a super simple and easy way to protect your internet surfing. Let me show you how. This is the app. So you can do a quick connect, but also you can choose other ones from around the world. Now, one great thing about that is that I can watch region lock content from around the world, say Japan or Korea. 
if you're into K-dramas. Which I'm not. Some Somebody else in his house is. But yeah, apart from that, it's to secure the internet. All your internet data stays behind a wall of next generation encryption. Plus there's no data logging as well, so all your private data stays private. They don't track, they don't collect the data. So secure your internet connection in NordVPN and you can get a huge discount on a two-year plan by going to nordvpn.com slash KaiW and enter the code KaiW to get an additional bonus totally free. And it's completely risk-free with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So go to nordvpn.com slash KaiW and enter the code KaiW.